if ever an author needed a PR campaign to establish their reputation, well, Arthur Conan Doyle was no such person. His prolific writing did that for him perfectly well, not least because his creation of Sherlock Holmes and Dr Watson gave British literature the most popular detective duo of all time. Indeed, Sherlock Holmes is so well known that Doyle's birthplace in Piccadilly Place, Edinburgh, is actually marked by a statue of Holmes and not the author himself. Perhaps a statue of Doyle would have been more appropriate, like this one in Crowborough, where he lived and died. Add to Holmes and Watson Doyle's science fiction stories, four books of poetry, his historical novels and plays, and his non-fiction, including autobiography and his analysis of the Boer War in which he participated, and you can see why he was so admired in his lifetime. He was a dynamo of creativity. In addition, he was a political campaigner, an all-round good sportsman, an adventurer, and an advocate for justice. This programme, however, is about something else, his commitment to spiritualism. Born on the 22nd of May, 1859, from age 17, he attended Edinburgh University Medical School for five years to train as a physician. In 1880, although not yet qualified, he ventured onto this sailing steamship, the Greenland whaler Hope of Peterhead, working both as a seaman and the nearest thing they had to a doctor. It was a brief but fascinating chapter in his life. Once qualified in 1881, he became the ship's surgeon on the SS Mayumba, seen here, which used to regularly ply its trade between Liverpool and West Africa. Finally arriving in Portsmouth with very little money, he set up his first medical practice in a rented house in neighbouring South Sea, seen here, where he lived for eight years. While waiting for new patients, Conan Doyle would write stories to fill the time, which were published, and so his destiny slowly changed from doctor to full-time author. His first book to feature Holmes and Dr Watson came in 1887 with A Study in Scarlet, and later he produced four full-length Holmes novels and 56 short stories about them to great acclaim. Numerous of these featured forays into the occult, reflecting his interest in psychical matters. For example, in 1899 he wrote The Brown Hand, featuring a poltergeist. In 1900 he published Playing with Fire, in which a unicorn was materialised at a seance, while The Leather Funnel featured psychometry, the ability of some sensitives to read the history of an object simply by holding it in their hands. The Land of Mist was another tale, this time giving Doyle the opportunity to convert to spiritualism a character he created as his alternative to Sherlock Holmes, the rabidly materialistic Professor Challenger. His writing certainly brought Arthur Conan Doyle financial independence and significant wealth, and mostly he published in the Strand magazine, which had an American edition, or the Cornhill magazine. In 1903, the United States McClure's magazine gave him $5,000 for just six new Sherlock Holmes stories. That's almost $150,000 in today's money. And yet he was ambivalent towards Sherlock, writing to his mother, I think of slaying Holmes and winding him up for good and all. He takes my mind from better things which is why Conan Doyle plunged both Holmes and his arch-enemy, Professor Moriarty, to their deaths down the Reichenbach Falls, seen here, in his tale entitled The Final Problem. It was while Conan Doyle lived in South Sea that his interest in psychic phenomena was first developed, influenced by Major General Alfred Wicks Drayson of the Portsmouth Literary and Philosophical Society, who impressed Arthur greatly. He attended over 20 seances, took part in telepathy experiments and sittings with mediums, and later he dedicated a book to Drayson entitled The Captain of the Pole Star. As his interest increased, 
Arthur also joined the Society for Psychical Research in London, and from 1900 onwards he gave ever more attention to psychic investigation while remaining cautious about mediums, aware that some of them were capable of deception. While Doyle is popularly seen as a gullible individual, this was not actually so. Take the case of a supposed medium, Mr Foster Craddock. When he attended this man's seance, he was suspicious, not least because only the evening before, Craddock's materialised spirit was seized during the seance and found to be Craddock himself in disguise. During Doyle's own seance with this man, another sitter seized a phantom claiming to be his own father, and it turned out to be Craddock, dressed in a sheet and wearing a turban. So Arthur fully recognised the existence of fraudulent mediums. The First World War had a huge impact in promoting spiritualism, with families wanting to contact their loved ones killed in action. And one consequence of Doyle's interest was that people came to him to relate their own experiences. This not only intrigued him, but helped him see that human consciousness is not based in brain function alone. Spiritualism offered solace to the bereaved, and Conan Doyle began lecturing about it to the public with a particular emphasis on Christian spiritualism. To my knowledge, the clip I'm about to show you is the only existing recording of Conan Doyle talking about this great interest of his. It's historic, not least for having been recorded even before the first talking feature film, The Jazz Singer, was released in October 1927. The full 10 minutes of Doyle's talk can be found on YouTube. So nobody can say that I formed my opinions on psychic matters uh, very hastily. It's just 41 years now since I wrote a signed article upon the subject, which appeared in a magazine called Light, so that I put myself on record. During these 41 years, I've never lost any opportunity of reading, of studying, and of experimenting on this matter. And I should think that my few remaining years will probably be devoted much more in that direction than in the direction of literature. There are many great mediums, many great psychical researchers, investigators of all sorts. All that I can do is to be a gramophone on the subject to go about, to meet people face to face, to try and make them understand that this thing is not the foolish thing which is so often represented, but that it really is a great philosophy and, as I think, the basis of all religious improvement in the future of the human race. In 1918, Conan Doyle published his first spiritualist polemic, The New Revelation, in the year his son Kingsley died of pneumonia after being wounded in the war. And some folk claimed that his son's death caused this interest in spiritualism, which is quite incorrect, as he pointed out in The New Revelation. It was followed in 1919 by another book, The Vital Message. In 1920, Doyle held a public debate in London with a well-known former Catholic priest turned sceptic and rationalist, Joseph McCabe. Doyle said spiritualism offered valid phenomena supporting the reality of life after death, while McCabe charged him with being duped by the deliberate trickery of mediums. But Doyle was not put off by such charges, touring a host of British towns to spread his message, Indeed, even before this debate, he'd addressed an estimated 50,000 people on the subject. Then, with his family in tow, he set out on a lecture tour to Australia, where he had audiences of as many as 2,000 people a night in the cities of Adelaide, Melbourne, Sydney and Brisbane. This book, The Wanderings of a Spiritualist, tells us he was invited there by Australian sympathisers, and later the family toured the eastern seaboard of the United States to great acclaim. But this American trip is probably better remembered for ending his friendship with the escape artist Harry Houdini, a professional debunker of mediums. Doyle's wife Jean claimed to contact Houdini's mother through automatic writing, but Houdini was having none of it. Arthur and Houdini also fought 
over whether the famous Boston medium, Marjorie, seen here, was genuine, which incidentally I think she was, and I've made a YouTube documentary about this entitled Houdini vs. Marjorie, Immortality on Trial. Being the energetic dynamo he was, Conan Doyle and his wife then embarked on an American West Coast campaign, which was also successful. In 1926, Conan Doyle published his major work, A Two-Volume History of Spiritualism. Critics claimed his assistant, Leslie Curnow, a fellow spiritualist, contributed a disproportionately large part of it, rather than Conan Doyle himself. But apart from this, Arthur became embroiled in more important spiritualist controversies. One was the validity of photographic mediums imprinting spirit images of deceased people on photographic plates while they were taking studio images of living people. There's no question some of these mediums were fraudulent, which helped bring spiritualism into disrepute. This photograph is probably the most famous of all spirit photographs taken by William Mumler in the United States. It allegedly shows the spirit of President Abraham Lincoln standing behind his wife. Conan Doyle was a supporter of several such British mediums, including the spirit photographer William Hope, who ran a seance group known as the Crew Circle. If you look on the internet, the virtually universal view is that this man, Hope, was a fraud, as demonstrated by investigators from the SPR, but Conan Doyle was angry about their deliberately undermining Hope by issuing a debunking pamphlet about him. So he produced this book, the case for spirit photography in defence of him. In it, he gave a detailed critique of the SPR's investigative methods, despite this setting him against popular sentiment. Just to clarify what spirit photography is, it involved people grieving the loss of a family member, applying to have their own photographs taken by bringing along to the studio their own photographic plates and marking them personally to guard against fraud. They hoped the result would include, in addition to the image of themselves, what was called an extra, being an image of the deceased, usually seen hovering in the background, often in a misty cloud. There are many such photographs still in existence, and these are just three examples. In his usual confident manner, Conan Doyle fought back against the sceptics, supporting Hope and his colleague Mrs Buxton, a fellow medium. They were working class folk, he was a carpenter, and they received no payment for their efforts. Their home in the town of Crewe, 36 miles south of Manchester, had many people making a trek to their door, or to the British College of Psychic Science in London where they also worked. These included socially elevated people such as Lady Grey of Falludon and Sir William Crookes, whose deceased wife appeared on his photograph. Conan Doyle used his book to assert that the SPR should examine their own investigator's shortcomings, and in his later life, Doyle abandoned the SPR in protest at the way it was run. He insisted the people best able to impartially assess the genuineness of spirit photographs was the society for the study of supernormal pictures, a short-lived organisation formed in 1918, of which he was a vice president. But to my mind, the most important part of his book comes at the end. 25 people of good standing give testimonies supporting the crew circle. They relate their personal experiences, explaining the control they had over the production process of these pictures, stating that they and their friends recognised the spirit images they received as genuine, and providing Doyle with their photographic evidence, some of which is published in the book. Many emphasised that Mr Hope and Mrs Buxton were honest, honourable people, and what interested me was that while some hoped for images of the deceased, sometimes what they received on their photographic plates were signed messages. Reading these 25 first-hand accounts certainly challenged my own assumptions. Take this example from Mrs Margaret Eleanor of London. Enclosed are four photographs, she wrote. All these were taken under the most stringent test conditions. 
I took with me some plates previously marked secretly by a second party, a sceptic. They were put into the slide by Mr Hope in my presence, and the slide was never for a moment out of my observation, and I subsequently followed every manipulation. The extra is of my father. An original photo of my father is also enclosed. These extras from the deceased give a view from a different angle to the original in each case. Until I read Conan Doyle's book, my presumption, along with everyone else's, was that spirit photography is bunkum. But now I pause for thought. The difficulty, surely, is discerning genuine photographs from fraudulent ones. But the popular assumption is that all of them were made using double exposures. The controversy that damaged Conan Doyle more than spirit photography was his acceptance that these photographs of fairies taken by two young girls near their home in Cottingley, Yorkshire, were genuine. In 1917, Elsie Wright, aged 15, and her 10-year-old cousin, Frances Griffiths, took five photographs such as these. And there can be little doubt that Doyle was influenced by the Kodak Company's confirmation that they had not apparently been tampered with. Conan Doyle only learned of them while touring Australia, and on his return to England he published The Coming of the Fairies. In it he defends the notion that there really are such things as nature spirits, elves and fairies. But in this biography of Doyle, entitled The Teller of Tales by Daniel Stashower, the author claims this book contributed to the erosion of his reputation with charges of delusion and that he was simply losing it in old age. And many would agree with this. But the denouement in this controversy only came decades after Arthur Conan Doyle died. As late as, late as July 1975, a TV investigation by the Magpie programme closed with these words. The two girls, both now grown women, still say they saw and photographed fairies. But using the original cameras and modern technical analysis, this man, Geoffrey Crawley, claimed beyond doubt that the photographs were fabricated. And in 1981, Elsie and Francis did finally admit that they had used cut-out drawings Elsie had made, inspired by the pictures of her Princess Mary's Gift Book, published in 1915. This confirmed the impression that Conan Doyle had been naive. But if you go online, you can find this book for sale, Seeing Fairies, from the Lost Archives of the Fairy Investigation Society, Authentic Reports of Fairies in Modern Times, it brings together an unprecedented 400 sightings from around the world, the biggest single collection of fairy experiences ever amassed. And we'll come back to fairies later. On the 7th of July, 1930, Sir Arthur died of a heart attack, aged 71, at home in Windlesham Manor, Crowbury in Sussex, followed by a memorial service held for him a week later here at the Royal Albert Hall. It was full to capacity with 8,000 people, with more left outside, a total of 10,000. This surely provides a measure of his public stature at the time, although denigrators argued that these people only turned up to see if he would materialise from the other side. There was a vacant chair on stage reserved for him, and what a sensation it would have been if this had happened with the famous clairvoyant Estelle Roberts declaring on stage that she could see he was present, even if others could not. Well, thinking about it, she was rather obliged to say that, wasn't she? Although he was originally buried on the 11th of July 1930 in Windlesham Manor Rose Garden, which incidentally is now a care home, eventually he was reinterred along his wife, his final resting place, in Minstead Churchyard in the New Forest in Hampshire. Now, you might expect Sir Arthur, who devoted a personal fortune and years of effort to promoting the reality of survival after death, would himself waste no time proving his survival. And the return of Arthur Conan Doyle, this book, indicates it did not take long. 
It's an edited version of Thy Kingdom Come, first published in 1933, and it's virtually unobtainable today. The first half tells a complex story involving the Polaire Brotherhood in France, and I won't go into it. Indeed, the communication from Sir Arthur in this book does not begin until page 95, coming as it does through the English trans medium Grace Cook, seen here. She was adopted by White Eagle, an American Indian spirit guide who gave Grace the name Minesta, one of her names in a former life. Later, she and her husband Ivan founded a brotherhood, the White Eagle Lodge, with branches in the United Kingdom, the United States and Australia. This first seance for Sir Arthur was introduced by White Eagle's prayers, couched in flowery, archaic language. It was profoundly Christian, like this. We seek to be at one with thee, divine and living Christ, the great white light. We await thy coming, O Spirit of love. We worship thee, and through thy love may the truth of life beyond death of the body dawn upon man, so that all fear of death be lifted from man, woman, and child. As demonstrated by this letter to the Polaire brothers, Arthur's wife clearly accepted as valid the messages through Minesta. And it should surprise no one that Sir Arthur's wish to prove his continuing existence was predicted at this seance. He said his spirit image would shortly appear in a photograph, as seen here, which was taken only a day later. The spirit photographer, Mrs. A. E. Dean, was supported by Arthur during his life, and she was a controversial figure in her own right. The hundred pages of post-mortem communication in The Return of Arthur Conan Doyle adds little to what spiritists already understood about the afterlife, but also there were surprises. It confirmed the existence of regions for earthbound spirits, the existence of a summer land and the existence of higher spiritual spheres, of course. But there are some surprises too. On page 124, Sir Arthur repeats his belief in fairies, and I quote, I now take much joy in visiting the great underworld, watching the little gnomes and fairies at work in the gardens of the earth, and on higher planes, happily weaving dreams and aspirations into a scene of beauty, in watching the little people, busily creating their representations of the divine love and beauty of God. So, was he justifying his view that he held when he was alive? Or was he delusional, even though on the other side? Or is he correct about fairies? Elsewhere, the book backs the reality of reincarnation, and also, he says, there are ethereal planets in the solar system that astronomers cannot see. Other statements include, in chapter 6, his assertion that both good and evil were creations of a father god and that you couldn't have one without the other. Now, if you expected Doyle to get in touch following his death, where else would you look? One answer is the British newspaper Psychic News, established in 1932 by its editor Maurice Barbonell, a medium. It's been archived in Canada by the University of Manitoba, covering the years 1932 to 2010, and it provides an excellent searchable database. Put in the name Conan Doyle, choose the 20 years after he died, and the search results provide 1,251 references to consult. For example, on the 16th of December 1933, Dr. Glenn Hamilton's Seance Circle in Winnipeg reported receiving information in which Doyle confirmed the truth of what Mrs. Grace Cook had already reported in England. Dr. Hamilton regarded this as, quote, one of the most amazingly successful cross-correspondence tests that I have known. And incidentally, here is a photograph of the medium Mary Marshall from Hamilton's seance circle, materialising in ectoplasm a tiny version of Conan Doyle's head, a photo that's actually been controversial for a long time. A September 1935 edition of Psychic News reports that Sir Arthur's signature was reproduced for the Marjorie Crandon Circle in Boston. 
the June edition of 1938, reported that a Scottish medium claimed to hear the tones of Doyle saying clearly, I am Arthur Conan Doyle, I want you to get in touch with my wife and send her a message. The lady was reportedly cautious, wanting proof of identity, and the Doyle voice replied by giving the initials of every member of his family. She did not know the Doyle family, and she had to check if these were correct, which they were. Still hesitant, she asked where she would find the address of his wife, and the reply allegedly provided her with the confidential telephone number of the Doyle cottage in the New Forest. When she called, Lady Doyle was there. As final proof of his survival, this spirit voice allegedly apported onto the woman's pillow at her London flat the key to Doyle's study door, a distance of 40 miles away. Doyle's voice confirmed it was the key from his manor house study, normally kept locked in Crowborough. Thereafter, this medium, unfortunately not named by the paper, became a regular provider of messages for the Doyle family. But the truth is that Lady Doyle and her family were flooded with claims from all around the world of spirit communications from Sir Arthur, but they refused to accept any of them without authentic evidence. If you want more reports of this nature, you need to consult the Psychic News University Archive in Manitoba. This next book about Conan Doyle's communication from the other side was published in 2009 by Roger Strawn, a philosopher and a university reader in education. It's entitled A Study in Survival, Conan Doyle Solves the Final Problem. Frankly, the means of communication described in this book is so weird that I was not overly impressed by it, even though one reviewer called it a delightful little volume. It seemed too far-fetched for me, relying as it did on Strawn's own possibly imaginative interpretation. The author's interest in Conan Doyle meant he possessed virtually all of his books, and also books about Doyle written by others, filling almost two metres of shelf space. If he wanted an answer to a question, he would choose a book at random, open it at random, and find the first sentence his eyes fell upon to see if the quotation fitted the situation, and Strawn claimed that more often than not it did fit. He asserts that many of the messages characteristic of Sir Arthur reflected aspects of his personality, as well as demonstrating paranormal knowledge of major news events. One critic remarked, the disembodied Doyle would not only have to know what questions and concerns were in the author's mind, he would also have to be able to see the books on Strawn's shelf and know through extraordinary memory recall every line of every page in these books and then somehow be able to lead the author to his choice of book, page and line. Admittedly, the only time I was vaguely impressed was in Chapter 7, Strawn's correspondence with Dame Jean Doyle, Arthur's daughter. He told her that he'd opened a book at a page referring to my daughter and that he'd also seen references to a ring. Dame Jean replied that her father had given her a ring with the family crest on it for her 17th birthday, and when she was seeking proof of her father's identity, she always wanted information that only he could have known, in particular that he had given her this ring. This was the first time anyone mentioned a ring to me, she told Strawn, but even when I read the chapter again, to me it seemed rather thin evidence. The final book I want to mention on post-mortem communication with Doyle is also very strange, and yet this one is impressive. It's called Arthur and Me, published in 2009 by Anne Traherne, a medium in Arthur's own hometown of Edinburgh. Anne was convinced that she was in touch with Conan Doyle, and she gathered together a group to work confidentially with him and his spirit team for psychical development. This book describes what they did, including using the Ouija board and table tipping as a means of talking to this team on the other side, and they focused largely on physical mediumship. The book also offers insights into how mediums develop their skills, and it's like being a fly on the wall, witnessing many of their private meetings first-hand, 
as demonstrated by chunks of verbatim records that they kept on each meeting. Antra Hearn says the spirits set her the task of writing this book as evidence of their own existence, and a number of well-known personalities in the spirit team reads like a who's who of those involved with the survival issue during their own lifetimes. To Oliver Lodge, the physicist and famous researcher, Gilfeather, a man unknown to me, Maurice Barbonell, the founder of Psychic News, Sir William Crookes, the famous scientist and psychic investigator, Gordon Higginson, former president of the Spiritualist National Union, Professor Joseph Bell, who inspired Doyle's character Sherlock Holmes, Mary Duffy, a former Edinburgh medium, and Arthur Findlay, who donated his grand home in England to create the Arthur Findlay College for Mediumship Development. And of course, there was the leadership of Arthur Conan Doyle himself. The most significant part of the book is its final outcome. With a need for the group to find a new venue for their meetings, members of Anne's group, inspired by the spirit team, saw in their mind's eye a grand building, with Anne in front of it holding a set of keys. Ultimately, they discovered it in Edinburgh, at 25 Palmerston Place, being in poor condition and available for sale. Once it had been purchased, it became a registered charity, the Sir Arthur Conan Doyle Centre for Mind, Body and Spirit. Although Anne stresses the goal of establishing this centre belonged to the spirits themselves and not to her group personally. Opened in October 2011 after renovation, it offers workshops and classes, lectures, therapies, private sittings and online events for people around the world. Since day one, it has also provided a psychical investigations unit. Arguably, it is Antra Hearn's and Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's greatest joint achievement. As a final comment, my overall opinion is that the evidence for Doyle's post-mortem survival is less satisfactory than I'd have wished, considering that he was the greatest exponent of spiritualism that the world has ever known. For him, survival after death was never just about establishing the nature of reality. It was also a religious matter. And he wondered why people accepting spiritualist phenomena had been so denigrated in the past. One supposition, he argued, was that spiritualism had simply been an outbreak of lunacy extending over two generations of mankind and two continents, a lunacy assailing men and women otherwise eminently sane. The alternative view he considered was that there has come to us from divine sources a revelation constituting by far the greatest religious event since the death of Christ, which alters the whole aspect of death and the fate of man. But let's face it, for the most part, folk have simply not bought into this message. A great world renewal through the truth of spiritualism has not happened. With materialism and consumerism entrenched here in the West, one even wonders if all Sir Arthur's globetrotting paid off. And if he were alive today, would he be sad about this, or would he be his usual indomitable self? Well, that's something for us to ponder on. Thanks for listening. Well, goodbye.